Welcome to the You Can't Handle the Emet podcast. Today's guest is another incredible and ordinary human being, Nicholas Skipworth Mitchell, discovered at the age of 17 that he had cancer and he had to have his leg amputated, all while serving in the army. Nick took from his experience while on active duty, not to become bitter and angry, but to use what he had learnt to help those who were traumatized and lost their legs due to explosions and landmines. Nick continued to serve in active hotspots and active war zones. After the military, he built an incredible life and has written two amazing books. Nick's life has been unbelievable, from skydiving to running a pub to moving his his life down to Durban where we were fortunate enough to have a chat. Nick was one of the original guests on my podcast but the audio of that file got corrupted and he was kind enough to offer to sit down with us again. He talks about his book Life in the Then Rhodesia and how to build a life with one leg and not letting any of those limitations holding him uh, hold him back. If you are at all interested in understanding what true courage is and how we can build a life of resilience and awesomeness, this is the show for you. If you'd also like to get some insight into what it was like to live in pre Rhodesia, which was uh, pre Zimbabwe, then this is for you. For those of you who are ex Rhodesians and would like to get your kids or grandkids a little bit of insight, please do pick up Nick's two amazing books and enjoy the podcast. Thank you, guys. And again, today's podcast is brought to you by Emmett Gyms. So that's us sponsoring our podcast for now. So enjoy the show, guys. It's going to be a good one. Welcome to the You Cannot Handle the Emmet podcast. We've got a very special guest on our show tonight, someone who I've known for a great many years and has really survived some incredible things and is here to share some of his wonderful life lessons with us. Um, Nick actually was the owner of the pub where I, I ended my drinking career, fortunately. So um, hopefully he will keep those stories about me to himself. And, uh, <laughs> and I just want to say welcome to the You Cannot Handle the Emet podcast, Nicholas Skipworth Mitchell. Thank you. Hi, Nick. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. Thanks for asking. Thanks yes, for sorry. making the yes. time, Nick. Oh, sorry. And um, you know, I just really, the, the reason I wanted to get you on the show is we actually did record an episode a couple of weeks back, uh, a couple of months back, uh, before the plague. And unfortunately, I messed up the audio there. And I just felt like what um, you really have so much to share with people and they can really benefit from your military service to your survival uh, and beating cancer and just, you know, your your experience in business and in life. And you know, so firstly, as a veteran, which I think in a war that there's not a lot of, um, I don't want to say use the word respect given to veterans, but I think it, it's, it's respect and there's not a lot of support really. Um, and I just wanted to chat to you about that and about your two books and about your speaking career. So we've got a lot <laughs> to discuss tonight and uh, you know, just, yeah, you're an amazing guy, Nick, and you, you've really been through a lot. And uh, you always have a smile. You're always warm. You're always engaging. And, um, you know, it, it's amazing. And I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to get to meet you and spend time with you and talk to you, both as a raging drunk, which I was, and now in sobriety. So I'm very, very happy to have, um, have you. I mean, if you can just sort of give us a little bit of a rundown on who you are, your background, and your experience. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um... Yeah, I think I was born and bred in Rhodesia and brought up until about the age of 13 in Rhodesia. And then my, my mother decided that it would be a good idea to take us offshore to England to complete our education. I think she, uh, she suspected what, what we'd be in for in the next couple of years and maybe didn't want that for her children. So the three, myself and my two other brothers, went off to boarding school in England. What sort of time? Was, what was the, the time frame, the year? It was 1975, okay. so um, end of the year, we'd finished the, the Rhodesian schooling year, ran from January to December, 
unbeknown to me, the English schooling year starts in September as the first term and, and ends in, <laughs> in August. So by the time we got to England in uh, December, January of 70, 75 or 76, it was, I'd already missed a term of, of boarding school. So being plucked out of uh, Rhodesian schooling where it was, uh, you know, sunny skies, fairly relaxed um, home just down the drag, um, all your mates into a an English winter um, and introduction to boarding school uh, was was my first probably real eye opener in life to realise that you know this is very different to what I'm accustomed to and what I'm used to. However, uh, I completed my term at, um, of two years, uh, completed O levels at English boarding school, and then left not really knowing what to do, um, a bit of a loose end. However, I'd, I'd been, obviously the Rhodesian blood flowed in my veins and I had a, a yearning to, to go back there. And um, I, I expressed this desire with my mother who was obviously not too pleased with that decision in life and, and didn't want me to proceed with that. However, I managed to convince that I was going out to Rhodesia to join the police and it was all, you know, fairly safe. Um, so I got my first job in UK as a as a hall porter in a hotel and saved up enough money, I think it was about 300 pounds in those days, to fly myself back out to Rhodesia and, and so begin my my life as, a, as an independent individual, if you like, at 17 years old. I did apply to join the police, but was turned down due to the fact that I was too short and a bit puny, actually. <laughs> and I think that is, well, in hindsight, that was because of the cancer that I unbeknowingly had at the time. Um, so, having and this was at the age, this was at the age of seventeen. This was at the age of seventeen. Yeah. Um, so then I applied to the air force. However, the air force, my my academic qualifications weren't good enough. So the good old army is is always the backstop, and I joined um, the Rhodesian Army Medical Corps assigned to 1st Battalion Rhodesian Light Infantry at the age of 17. Um, so March 1979 was uh, when I went into the army. And a few months into my service, I, I had this lump behind my knee, which I felt was, was starting to bother me. But up until then, I'd been aware of it, but it was painless and it wasn't causing me any any grief, so I, I pretty much ignored it, and it was, you know, behind your knee and painless, so why would you want to, you know, worry about things like that? Anyway, I went off to the the, um, the army medical doctor and said, well, could he have a look at this and give me a couple of tablets to sort it out, and he referred me to a surgeon, and the surgeon took one look at it, and, and that's when I realized that there was something a little bit more serious going on here than just a lump behind the knee. Um, he took a, a biopsy, uh, and when the biopsy came back, he said, unfortunately, you have a, a, a malignant growth behind your knee, and we're going to uh, have to amputate. Um, and it was as, as cold and as, as direct as that. There was no um, playing it up or making it sound better than it was. So the biopsy came back on the Thursday afternoon. On Tuesday morning, I was in hospital preparing to have my leg amputated. How, um, how do you, what was going through your mind those few days? I mean, that's your young, active, I mean. Yeah, I think all of the mm. normal sort of teenager stuff, I think goes through your mind. Uh, I was a very self-conscious youngster. I was um, almost bordering on shy. Um, and this was obviously an enormous thing to deal with. One is that you don't know now whether you're going to be able to drive a car, uh, how are you going to pick up girls, how are you going to conduct your life now, having it completely turned upside down and, and becoming what you would consider a not normal person. You're, you're now going to look completely different. So, yeah, it was... It was I wouldn't say it was traumatic. It was just very confusing to think uh, how how is your life now going to pan out, um, having just almost achieved your your initial goal in life of joining the army, and this is what you wanted to do. 
um, this was now all falling around uh, because of the news that you've been given. And so, how, what was your your thought sort of about the army? I mean, it's you had tried to get into the other branches. And then yeah, this I, I I didn't I hadn't given it. Oops, sorry, I hadn't given it much thought at that point as to um, what the army would say. I think I was more wrapped up in my own personal uh, space with regards to how I was going to manage my life. Um, right. And only after the fact, when the army came to me and said, look, we're, we're not going to medically discharge you. We will retain your services because we do require uh, medics. And there's a, there's a great shortage of medics in, in, our, in our army. That it then dawned upon me that, yeah, I could have actually been discharged after you know, a, a brief couple of months in the army um, and had to have made my, my way on my own. So the Rhodesian army was, was very, very good to me in that respect where they, they kept me on. I was obviously fitted with prosthetics through the army. Um, and although I, I never qualified for a military pension or disability pension because it wasn't caused by the military, uh, they obviously gave me a pardon the pun, a step up in terms of getting fitted out with, with prosthetics and, uh, right. and, and almost integrating into society, but in a military society, if you like. Um, so that gave me the confidence to, to carry on with this disability. So I, I just want to go back to sort of your time in hospital. Um, but I also wanted, could you tell us sort of what was going on in the country at that time? Because you, yes. you were at war. Yeah, we were at war. Uh, I was admitted to the Andrew Fleming Hospital, which was the, the major hospital in Salisbury that was treating um, all of the, the casualties that were being brought in. So it was probably one of the, the best hospitals, trauma hospitals in the world at the time, second to... I forget the name of the hospital, but it was in Northern Ireland that had obviously got the experience through the mm -hmm. British troops being in Northern Ireland. Uh, so while I was there, there were a lot of casualties that were being brought in with traumatic injuries and war-related war injuries, um, which I think was my first, if you like, um, lesson to myself, is that I, I'd at least had time to prepare for what was coming my way. Um, I'd been warned beforehand that uh, my limb was going to be amputated and I had time to process that and um, and and prepare myself for what is going to happen whereas a lot of the injuries that came in to the wards while I was there were were traumatic landmines um, etc where limbs were being lost and these soldiers were waking up the next morning without a limb and not having had that time to prepare for it um, so, yeah, that's, that was sort of the beginning of my, um, if you like, my positivity towards having a disability or having a prosthetic was I, when I was discharged from the hospital, I went back to the hospital on a, on a volunteer basis to have a chat to these chaps and sort of say, it's not that bad. You know, life doesn't end here because you've lost your limb. There is life after losing a limb. So, I mean, you're 17 years old. You... You've just had you've just had your leg amputated, and while recovering, you're going back and helping others, and supporting yeah. them through what they're going through. What was your drive behind that? I mean, what was the desire? I think the desire was there were a couple of factors. One was the fact that I, because I joined the Rhodesian Army Medical Corps, my my interests were medicine anyway, and my my interest was to help people. Um, and if I couldn't be an, an operational medic at that time, then I could at least do what I could in the hospital to help uh, make guys feel a bit better. And also the nursing staff, they were a great encouragement to me doing that. And, and they would come to me and say, listen, we've got a guy down in, in Ward B12 who's, who had his, land, his leg lost in a landmine yesterday and he was brought in. Would you, you know, would you, mind going down and having a chat to the guy and just, you know, sharing your experience with him. So it was, I think it was through probably a little bit of coercion, a little bit of my own uh, initiative that I, I became involved with that. How did you find that it helped you? 
because we, you know, we're, I'm always a big advocate of service to others without expectation in terms of building our own lives. And there's something, you know, you, you've been through some incredible trauma and now you're giving of yourself to helping others that are in the same boat. Uh, maybe, as you said, even you know, your words like worse off because they didn't have yes. a time to prepare. How did you find that that helped you? I think that's exactly how it helped me. It made me realize that there are people with a lot worse off situation than myself. Um, as much as this was a, a, a traumatic and emotionally uh, difficult thing to, to get to grips with, uh, it, was, it was easier for me. And I felt that it was easier for me and that I should therefore um, share that with, with these guys and make it, try and make it easier for them. Right. If you were to, uh, you know, we are fortunate in our country that we're not at war at the moment. And there are plenty going on around the world. And that's the value of podcast. It's not just, you know, and, and being on YouTube. It's not just stuck and retained in, in one place. Um, if you were to meet and speak to uh, a young person today who had been, lost a limb, what advice would you give them? Advice, counsel, what would you say to them? What would you share with them? I think the main thing is that you can, you can conduct a life as any other normal person. And in fact, you can conduct a more constructive life than any other normal person because it's, it's more difficult for you to, to be a normal person. Therefore, having... Uh, this kind of trauma makes you a stronger person ultimately. And, um, you know, my, my one leggedness has become my, if you like my personality and my character, that's how people know me. Um, if I, if I didn't have my leg taken off, I would just be probably just another, another person out there in the world. But, uh, I became known as the medic with one leg. Um, and they're in sort of, started my life of, of being known as Skippy, uh, which was derived from my surname, obviously being far too long to manage, but being Skipworth Mitchell. Mm. And having one leg, um, Skippy was obviously that Australian kangaroo program that was uh, on TV at the time. So I became Skippy, which was basically associated with me hopping. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, if you didn't know, that's why I'm called Skippy. No, I know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, you, see, you basically took what happened to you and you turned it into your superpower. You took yes. what happened to you and, and used it to not build a life of ordinary. As it yeah. Were. I think it made me want to do things that uh, I'd wanted to do anyway, but also uh, to do things just to prove to myself that I could do them. Can you give um, us a few examples of the craziness? Well, things like skydiving, you know, yep. skydiving was fairly, fairly insane. And uh, whether, you know, I wasn't the, I wasn't the initial paraplegic or disabled person to go jump out of an airplane, but mm. it still was for me, uh, it was something that I wanted to do. And uh, I, I went off and did it. So, you know, it, it, it had its challenges and it had its exciting moments and it had its terrifying moments, but uh that was one of the things, um, you know, white river rafting um, with the legs strapped onto the canoe in front. Um, right. All sorts of mm -hmm. all sorts of things that that you know you would expect uh, would only be done by an able-bodied person, uh, and would be much more difficult as a disabled person to do. But all of these things that able-bodied people do can be done by disabled people. Right. I think just, um, you know, for me, one of the, the things that drives me mad is seeing able-bodied people parking in disabled people's spaces. Um, and I've noticed, yeah. like with you, you don't park in a disabled bay. Um, no. You know, and it's, I don't know if just maybe if you'd like to give a message to someone who, to those people who park 
<laughs> inappropriately. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't pop and, and, because and, I believe. Yeah. And by the way, please, uh, we, we're trying to keep this a non-explicit show. So. Yes, no, sure. <laughs> yes, uh, ignorance is not a disability, they say. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't believe I, I need a disabled parking bay. That's why I, I refuse to park there. It, it would be convenient sometimes, but I'm able to walk. I'm able to, to, to park mm. in a normal parking lot. And uh, I've, never, I've never driven a, a modified car. I've always driven a manual car. Um, Better than me, might I add, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's why I don't avail myself of... of of disabled uh, immunities because I don't believe I'm disabled. Uh, I believe I just have a, um, I believe I, I just have one leg that doesn't make me disabled. Right. hundred yeah. percent. I, wa- I wanted to talk about your books. Um, if mm. you could yeah, give us a rundown, uh, you've got written two now and I've written uh, two just, now. Yeah, how they came they, about and uh, you know, from stories to a book to two books now. Yeah, the the first book, which is called Out on a Limb, um, fairly appropriately titled, yeah, <laughs> came from, I grew up, uh, as I've said, in Rhodesia and in the army, and uh, my brother, who left to go to the UK a year prior to me going over to the UK, stayed in the UK, joined the British Army. He's five years older than me. So we didn't share much of a life together um, up until the age of probably my late twenties, early thirties, we started to, to communicate with each other. Um, up until then, as I say, he was in the British army doing his thing. I was out in Africa doing my thing. And we didn't have a close brotherly relationship. Um, then as I say, in uh, probably 20 odd years ago, uh, he started to come out to them a lot more to, to, uh, come out to my dad's farm. Uh, My parents were divorced when I was very, very young. And we used to share stories. I'd drive him up from Johannesburg to, to Bulawayo, um, and we'd catch up on, on our life while we were apart, basically since boarding school and, and 20 odd years ago. So um, he took all of these stories and I, I related them because they pretty much, you know, the skydiving stories and the, the, um, the smuggling cars to the Zimbabwe border stories and all these various things that we've got up to over the years. And he, that's a story very, you never mentioned. That's, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it, it, all these stories. He, he was a fairly young father at that stage and he wanted to record a lot of this because he thought, well, this is good stuff to sort of put down on black and white and, uh, because once we pop our clogs, there's nobody that's going to mm. share these stories with our children. Right. So eventually he had this whole sort of 20 or 30 different stories that I'd related to him. And he, he sort of unwittingly one day, I think said, you know, we could actually write a book about this. And that sort of sowed the seed. So we started working on it about five years ago and, and putting these stories together. Um, my brother is, is, is much more, uh, familiar with the use of the English language, if you like, than I am. And he's, right. he's very good at writing and putting things down in black and white. So I would supply the stories and my brother would, would formulate them into a readable um, format. Right. And that's how this book was, was, was born. And it was basically, as I said, called Out on a Limb, Life with a Disability and Stories of a Time Past. So it covers the first part of, of really my growing up uh, my losing my leg, my serving in the Rhodesian Army, uh, up until leaving and coming down south. And then the second part of the book is about coming to South Africa and and uh, then having to sort of leave the military world and go into the world of corporate. Um, right. And, uh, you know, corporate is, is, is a very different lifestyle uh, and a very different animal to the military life. Um, which is probably why I've left corporate so many times. Well, certainly twice to, to venture out on my own yes. um, with varying degrees of success. Right. Uh, 
So hey, that was the I, first I, book. I, try, I tried my best to, to support. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Just for those that are, are, are interested, I met you, yes, in 19, 1998 when I opened the keg. Yep. Uh, July 1998. Yeah. Um, and you were one of my, my patrons who, uh, it was you that, that coined the phrase, this is my lounge. <laughs> yes. Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, that was 20, 22 years ago now. What? Oh, my word. Wow. Yeah. Yep. It's that long ago. <laughs> so, um, moving on from that swiftly. Yes. <laughs> so, after Monkey. the release of, yeah. of my first book, which was uh, November mm. 2018. Right. I, um, I, actually, I actually wanted to ask you about that. Did you write that book with anyone sort of in mind or who, who should read the book? And I mean, there's quite an interesting story about how it was published, yes. how you distribute it. I mean, you've done it your way. So I think like, yeah. who, who, who is the book for? I think initially the book was written for, as I said, for as a, as a record for a personal record for our family. Uh, and then as we put it together, we realized that, that there was a lot of, stories that relate to disability and uh, overcoming disability. And um, we thought that, that a lot of the stories in the book were, were disability related and that it should really be, be aimed at people with a disability uh, who can read it and can, you know, it's, it's not a heavy reading book, it's a lighthearted book. Um, and I think it would inspire people uh, with disability to read the book to realize that um, it doesn't matter how many times you get put down uh, you can always get back up again and there's always something that you can do um, and carry on um, so yes I think it's it's an easy reading book it's 166 odd pages uh, right with pictures okay uh, <laughs> So yes, I think anybody although the names and have, in places have been changed to protect some of the not so in innocent. certain places, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. And then obviously the, the the book has a huge Rhodesian following because mm. it is about being brought up in Rhodesia and family life and and military life in Rhodesia. So I had a following of of fellow Rhodesians, um, which is what uh, inspired the second book. Of, which was written in conjunction with a friend of mine, Mike Norton, who I first met, met out in Rhodesia on my first operational uh, deployment. He was with the police, and he he had a he had a log, a record of this operation and the two weeks that that my unit were at on this operation. So I, so, asked I mean, him if you I could you use... weren't you weren't kept back. I mean, you were in active. I, I was. In fact, I was deployed as an untrained soldier. <laughs> the situation was so dire in Rhodesia at the time. Uh, this was in April 1979. So it wasn't too long after, well, it was two months after I joined the army. Um, there was a, what they called a fire force operation based 20 kilometers outside of Salisbury. Um, and it was a, it was an operation that was to to stem a guerrilla insurgency into Salisbury itself to uh, upset the, the Zimbabwe Rhodesian elections of April Muzarewa. Um, and that is just prior or just after the Rhodesian oil reserves were blown up, uh, the two Viscounts were shot down. So there was some, some fairly serious stuff going on in Rhodesia at the time. Uh, and as I said, there was a dire shortage of medics. So I was deployed out to this operation, which is Operation Enterprise to go and assist in a mobile uh, surgical unit, which was set up at the, um, at the fire force base. Um, so that was my introduction to medicine really. Prior to even doing a medics course, I was involved in, in um, minor amputations, suturing uh, mm. gunshot wounds, all sorts of stuff. So um, yeah, that, that's where I met, uh, as I said, Mike Norton, who uh, was the special branch officer in charge at the time. Um, so when he released his, or he released on a blog, uh, these reports of his, and I said, well, could I utilize, utilize those reports and formulate it into a book? Because they, I'd already now 
got a, a following of, of Rhodesians that were interested in military operations. And this operation specifically hadn't been recorded anywhere. Uh, all sorts of other operations in the Rhodesian War had been extensively covered. So that was the birth of my second book, which is completely different to my first. It's basically a uh, an account of a, of a war operation called Operation Enterprise, the Battle for Salisbury. And that was released in February this year. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. I think it would be an amazing read because th there's not a lot of history that's spoken now with the younger generation of Rhodesia moving to become Zimbabwe. And I think the, the books would be fantastic sort of for the kids or the grandkids um, of veterans and of people that sort of that, that lived there and have moved down. I mean, there's, there's a large population of, of former Rhodesians uh, that are in South Africa um, that have come yeah. and made this their home. It, how, how have you found sort of the, how people sort of deal with veterans in South Africa? I think, you know, I belong to the South African Legion. Uh, I'm the chairman of a branch down here in KZN. I belong to the Moths. Uh, I belong to the Regional Light Infantry Regimental Association. So, Can you give our listeners just sort of an idea of what those, those are and what the Moths are? Yeah, sure. The South African Legion is obviously a, uh, an offshoot of the British Legion, which was formed after the First World War. Uh, with the sole intent of looking after ex-veterans, their motto being not for ourselves, but for others. Um, so the South African Legion look after veterans um, and their sole purpose is a, obviously a non-governmental organization and it raises funds to, to house, feed um, and generally look after veterans. Uh, the Moth, which is obviously the memorable order of the Tin Hats, is an, is an ex-military association that was also formed to look after military veterans. And the Rhodesian Light Infantry Regimental Association is obviously just the association of the unit that I belong to, um, which uh, also is, has the sole purpose of looking after uh, not so much just veterans in general, but certainly veterans that served within the, the Rhodesian Light Infantry. Um, I, I think and I think it's worldwide that veterans are not well uh, looked after and not not really acknowledged. And particularly in South Africa, you know, I think the Rhodesian situation is, and we all know that that Rhodesia pretty much dissolved overnight on the 18th of April in 1980 when when Robert Mugabe took over and and the diaspora of Rhodesians all over the world is, is testimony to the fact that everyone just left. Uh, and it wasn't a post-battle or post-war type of uh, medication or build the troops up because all of the troops that were dis or demobbed basically found themselves in civilian street the next day with suit and tie and, and trying to sell uh, motor cars or something. So, and the South Africans, I think, have an equally difficult uh, scenario in terms of the fact that the Southwest African War or the, the border war was never really considered a South African war at home. You know, it's something that the boys were sent off to, but it never, it never came home to South Africa as such. And I found that when I came down from Rhodesia, this alienation of your, of your fighting forces with just general civilian life was quite, quite weird. Um, and I think a lot of the guys have been pretty much forgotten the, you know, the, the veterans, the injured veterans from that war. And there are a number of them. Um, are you still in contact with some of them? Yes, I am. Um, in fact, there's a very good friend of mine who's uh, ex, ex-Israeli, ex-American army, ex-Rhodesian army, which is where I first met him. And then he, he was with the, uh, the Rekis in Southwest Africa, he lost both his legs in a, in a landmine incident up in Southwest Africa. He, I see him every couple of years uh, and he rides his Harley Davidson around the world without any limbs. He's actually transversed the globe twice on his Harley Davidson without any limbs. Um, and he raises money for Cheshire Homes and for uh, war veterans, disabled war veterans. 
Um, so yeah, there are a number of them that I'm in contact with. And I think the the one thing that I've learned dealing with addicts and with alcoholics is that all all addiction, all inappropriate use of substances, drugs, alcohol, food, shopping, gambling, is as a result of being unable to deal with trauma. And you're talking about physical injuries. There, there's also the emotional scarring. I mean, you guys saw some horrendous. And you know, I'm not a veteran. I never served, never did national service, so it's difficult for me to to talk about. But you know, it's the scars that people carry on the inside. And I know we spoke about um, a few guys that, that you know that have, you know, it, it cost them the quality of their life. Uh, hmm. in terms of not being able to deal with the trauma that they went through, not being acknowledged um, with the trauma that they went through. And what, what, you've, what you've survived and what you've experienced as well is, you know, this is why we spoke about you, which I think would be phenomenal if you would start a speaking career. And I mean, you, you started initially helping those kids uh, – in the hospital that have lost their limbs right after you've lost yours. And that takes, you know, that you weren't um, expressing anger or resentment or blame. You just got down to helping others and serving. And um, I think you starting a speaking career would be some, first, yeah, I'd love, I want to get you back on here to chat about the, the war, because I think that's something that needs to be brought to the attention of, uh, of people, you know, the history is written by the victor, and there's a lot of um, a lot of good people on both sides. That, you know, their stories deserve to be told, because yes. I think my, my understanding of war is not about fighting ultimately for a cause. Where you know Rhodesia was a different story because you were fighting to protect your homes, but in it you're fighting for your to keep the guys next to you and around you safe and alive. Yeah. And um, yeah. that, that's an incredible bond. And that bond also gets taken away from you when, when you come into civilian life. So I just think, it's, yes. it, it, you know, it would add incredible value. And it's something that I'm, I want to do with this podcast is also to have you back to talk about, um, you know, just what you've been through because people deserve to, uh, deserve to hear it and understand that it doesn't matter what you're going through. You, you can survive and you can use it to build a life of quality. Um, and that's the point of the show is to really help people understand that while we're surviving, uh, I mean, you know, uh, you've been, you've been robbed at gunpoint as well in your home, <laughs> you know, that story yeah. as well, you know, you've been through some pretty challenging things. So, I mean, that's yeah. something to share. I think you've got to, you know, you've got to pick it up, uh, pick yourself up and move on. As you say, uh, the the keg where we met was was a was a great venture of mine to to leave corporate to invest my whole life into into that keg. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work, and that it didn't work for a number of reasons. One, namely the the first recession that hit us in in ninety eight, where interest rates mm. shot up to twenty five percent, and it just became unserviceable to to yeah. to service the loan. Um, you know, Hagen's went wheels up. And there were a whole number of reasons why it didn't work. The um, development that was supposed to happen around. The development you never that was did. supposed to happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for, for a number of reasons, it didn't work. Uh, it wasn't through lack of trying. Um, but in that time, I obviously lost everything that I had. Um, I became insolvent. I lost my house. Um, I lost everything except the, the liquidators, said something to me, which has always stuck in my mind. We'll take everything except the hose pipe and the dog kennel. <laughs> I don't know why they felt that that was important, but anyway, so okay. I was left with the hose pipe and the dog kennel. Um, Did they take the dog? Uh, fortunately, the dog died just prior to that. So okay. yeah, Sorry. yeah. So he wasn't left homeless. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it was in that time, obviously I got, I got held up at gunpoint in the keg. That was, that was fairly mm. traumatic. Um, I got shot uh, while leaving the keg one evening at the McDonald's in Edenvale. Um, that was that was very traumatic. Um, and then shortly after after 
getting rid of the keg and going back into corporate, that's when I got uh, home invasion and, and tied up and held it by three armed uh, invaders in my house. Um, so that was a fairly difficult time of my life. Uh, you know, I, I really felt as though somebody was was trying to punish me for something here. Um, and that's when I decided to uh, possibly to, to sell everything up, whatever I had, which wasn't much, and moved down to, to Durban to, to pursue a, a more genteel life, if you like. Uh, and Durban's been very good to me. So, you know, again, the message is that it doesn't matter what's happened. You can pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and start again. It, 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 one of the things, and, and like I'm, I'm struggling for words here, which is not something that happens often, and um, mm. you may want to write it down. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to put my finger on what is it that, uh, where does the strength come from in people and the people that I talk to and interview on this on the show? And I'm, what I'm starting to unpack the more I do it is I think it's, it's not about this overwhelming strength, the superhero strength that is needed. It's just that, as you said, you pick yourself up and you carry on day to day. I think it's, it's, it's just for today. I'm going to make it through today. I'll make yeah. it through tomorrow. And it, it's, you know, that's one of the gifts of, of recovery and being an alcoholic. We learn just for today. And we learn that I can't deal with everything. Uh, I, I, you know, if I, if I think about the next three months, six months, a year, five years, I'll, I'll go mad or I'll, I'll break down. So it comes down just for today. And that's it. You pick yourself up and you carry on. I think people use the expression attitude very flippantly. And it is attitude because I can't yes. think of what the silver bullet is that makes, you know, I'm no, I'm no special to anybody else. Uh, I'm just another normal Joe in the street who happens to have lost his leg and has happened to have had a few, you know, curveballs thrown his way in his life. But uh, in my opinion, it's it's all about attitude. It's it's not about um, woe is me and well, you know, this is it. I've been dealt this, so I'm going to just crawl up and die now. Um, you have to you have to carry on, um, and I think that's that's what it is. Is it's it's just having that mental attitude to to say okay well that was an experience um in fact on my outward bound school in in wales the instructor there said you when you're bored you're issued a kit bag and your objective in life is to fill that kit bag with experiences and if you haven't filled that kit bag you haven't led your life um, and everything that happens to you is an experience and you put it into your kit bag and you carry on to the next one that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So yeah. what's what sort of next for you? Well, again, I find myself at that crossroads in life, having been retrenched at the end of last year. Um, um, so I don't know what's next for me. Um, the, writing, the writing of the books has been, has been, has been an interesting uh avenue in my life that i i never thought i would even pursue but uh as you say here i am two books later and uh and, and self-published self-published yes um you got to tell you know, us that story because that that's absolutely fantastic i mean i've been well, back years, if somebody had asked me how do you publish a book or how do you get to to write a book i would have thought well it's, it's far too difficult I, I i wouldn't even imagine how to do it well, I think I have an idea now. You and I are going to put a YouTube video together on how to publish a book. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, there yeah, I mean, self-published does have its downfalls, but it also has its, its merits. Um, so w what are those? The merits are that you don't give away the rights to your story to a publisher. Um, you don't give away any kind of profit to a retailer. Uh, it is your book. Uh, it is solely yours. You've you've produced it and printed it and, and published it uh, at your own cost. Okay, these are physical books. These are not e-books. Yes. I mean, this is a no, no. These these are book. These are physical books. Oh, there we go. There's Fantastic. Out on a, yeah. out on a limb. On a limb. And, yeah. and there is the uh, Operation Enterprise, the battle for Salisbury. Yeah. Fantastic. So yeah. the physical books. The the out on a limb book has been. Uh, 
has been published on Kindle, Amazon Kindle, uh, and is available there. Uh, but the out on a, uh, the Operation Enterprise is a physical book that isn't on on Kindle um, yet. Yet, yeah. Uh, yeah, I suppose the only downfall is that you you do restrict your audience in terms of exposure uh, because you have to do all of the marketing through social media uh, and whatever uh, media is available to you. Um, but social media is a very powerful tool these days. And that you, I mean, you did you you've reprinted the first book. I've reprinted the first book and I've reprinted the second book. Already. Second, okay, yeah. so yeah. it's working. And, it is um, working. Yes, yes and, yeah. and then you come on shows like this and tell people why they should read the book. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I, I think it's amazing. Like anyone that has a South African connection and as you know, Rhodesian uh, connection and family should get and read that book because it's part of their history and understanding. And I think there's also tremendous value. Um, I know a lot of uh, service people in the United States and Israel as well, as you mentioned, are fascinated yes. about the Rhodesian war because so many things were developed in that war. Um, you, yeah. know, you know, your, your fire fault, like just massive. I think you hold, hold a couple of records for the most, uh, you know, there's the most um, parachute jumps into the most operational like, parachute, parachute jumps, jumps in one day. Yeah. Which is yeah. like, yeah, you know, and then it's unbelievable. So, yeah. It's really, it's for people that just would like a little bit of history and anyone who's served, you know, would, it was a fascinating war because a lot of the wars that are fought today are overseas uh, yeah. for, for the Western world. And, you know, this is now, the, you're fighting for your home. And yeah. also, you know, the, the war was lost and that way of life was lost. So the, it's important for, I don't know, am I allowed to say lost? Um, well, you know, it was it was right. lost politically. Let's put it yes, that way. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, which is even worse. Um, yeah. You know, the the politicians quit. Yeah. So. Well, um, Rhodesia was betrayed ultimately, okay. and that that opens up a whole new can of worms and discussion. And, and people are are very vociferous in their opinions as to whether we were betrayed or weren't betrayed. But right. ultimately, we were betrayed by the politicians. So, whatever the reason is, it's forty years ago now. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's all part of history, but as you say, it's, it's an important part of history and one that needs to be, one that needs to be documented, one that people need to read. Um, you know, and, and authors uh, have put out books like The Viscount Down, which, which details the story of the Viscount shooting, which, you know... Yeah, that that was a passenger it, airline. It, both were passenger airlines, yeah. yes, um, of which the second one all, all perished. Um, in the first one, all but ten perished, um, and three of them, three or four of them, I think it was, escaped. Uh, right. But the, the remaining six were bayoneted in the bush. So, mm. and yet, you know, the American Pan Am over Lockerbie was was world news. Um, the Twin Towers, world news, uh, and these were all utilizing passenger commercial aircraft to commit acts of terror. The both the Viscounts shot down in Rhodesia received no condemnation and no exposure to the rest of the world. And civilian, civilian aircraft. Yeah. And there were civilian aircraft, yeah. Mm. Purely because Rhodesia was the pariah in the world. So, you know, these things do need to be, and as you say, uh, the, the tactics utilized in the Rhodesian Bush War are being taught even in, in armies today. The American Marines utilized the fire force tactic. Um, in places like Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq and all these various other places. But also uh, another interesting theatre where I would like to get my books uh, more known is in those American um, Afghanistan veterans, UK veterans, uh, American veterans. So in, in those veteran societies? Yes, um, because I think they can relate to even though it was an African war, mm. they can relate to right. I think it was the, stories. Yeah, the, the double tap and the triple tap were also developed. Uh, yes. With the, so, which is, yeah, I mean, the, the, there's a lot of history there. Uh, yeah. Right, Nick, we've got to get you into those marketplaces. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. That's fantastic. 
Um, yeah, and again, I apologize for saying uh, lost. I mean, I'm not that uh, clued up on on the history. So, yeah. but I could see your I could see in your face. You know, that wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah another another sensitivity. Another thing in terms of the disability was I spent six months at a place called Sanga Lodge in Rhodesia, which was the forces rehabilitation home. Uh, which was way up and almost on the Mozambican border, um, where the really severe cases uh, of trauma were sent to rehabilitate. Um, and that, I think, also made me realize shortly after I'd lost my leg that you know, all, I'd, all I'd lost was a limb, and uh, it really wasn't a big deal when you're dealing with patients that have lost half of their brain through gunshot wounds or four limbs or you know badly mutilated from from acts of war um, you realize that uh, you're okay you know this, you, it's almost trifling what you're trying to do deal with by comparison right. to what other people are, are dealing with so i think that also um gave me a different viewpoint right from this from the get-go in terms of of uh, the disability not really being a disability it's uh, my my late mother always used to call it playing the glad game. Yeah, you know, and I think that's gratitude, and it's just understanding gratitude. And as you said, gratitude is an attitude. And yeah, uh, you know, where you can understand that you, it could have been worse. And the those are for the there are those who are far worse off than we are, but it's also through service to them that we can improve our, our quality of life. Yes. So, yeah, back to your point of where to from, from here. Um, the answer is I don't really know, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that something will, <laughs> will come up. Uh, as you say, motivational speaking maybe is, is an avenue to investigate. Um, or I don't know whether you would call it motivational speaking or just and sharing, sharing strength. Sharing strength. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's what we're going to call it going forward. Yes, yeah. I think sharing strength is much better than motivational speaking because, yeah. you know, motivation comes from from within. I can't motivate you to do anything mm. if you if you are not wanting to do it. That's uh, a, yeah, but yeah. sharing M motivation is like a warm bath. It's lovely, but you have to keep topping it up. It doesn't last. <laughs> Stre strength is always there. That's the thing. Yes. You know, yes. that's it. Yeah, sharing strength. So, you know, Nick, Nick, I'd also love to get you uh, and if you can wrangle a couple of your, um, your former, your, your ex, uh, what would you refer to them, ex-servicemen, uh, veterans? Yeah, um, ex-veterans. You know, we could maybe chat about the book and um, um, about some of your experiences in the military as well and what it was like because it was pretty unique. It was very unique, yes. Um, Certainly unique from the aspect that I was, uh, I don't know if there has been a serving operational medic um, with one limb. With one limb. Or with one limb missing. Yeah. Um, you, you, weren't, you weren't back behind the lines pushing papers. No, no, no. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was running under helicopters with one limb <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> swinging out the side, which was quite challenging. Yeah. Well, you, you yeah. are insane, so it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Nick, how do people get hold of you? How do people get hold of the book? People get hold of me on my email address, which is okay. skipworth61 at gmail.com. Right. That's can find uh, me. okay. And I'll link that down below in the show notes. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much the, the only way to get hold of me or the book is, is through my email address or my cell phone number. I am on right. Facebook. I do have a Facebook site uh, of Out on a Limb. Right. And I have a Facebook site of Operation Enterprise. Okay. And, and then, I also have a Skipworth mm, Mitchell Facebook site. Okay, fantastic. And Out on the Limb is available on Audible as well through Amazon. It's uh, Amazon no, Kindle. Not, Sorry, not Ant, available no, no, on, on Audible, Amazon, Amazon Kindle. So Kindle. It's a readable version. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, so it's a okay. readable uh, one, not a not an audible, not an audio book. Okay, so after the plague, I'm coming down with this microphone, and yeah. uh, you're going to read your book, and we can make an audio version of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Yeah, yeah it's like no pressure, no pressure. See, yeah, no, use, and yeah. you have to use the radio voice. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so there yeah. we go. Okay, fantastic. And uh, so that's that, that's the books. There are copies available if people would like yes, to get their are. hands on them. And I think yeah. anyone with any family history connected there on both sides, um, you know, we should be should be reading this book, uh, these books because of the just it, it's part of history that uh, has been casually forgotten. If yeah. what we're putting it. I think that there's a number of aspects to it. One is obviously being brought up in Rhodesia and, and mm. people can can relate to that. Yes. The other is obviously the military aspect and people can relate to that. And the other is is reuniting with family. You know, as I said, my parents were divorced when I was very, very young. Uh, I stumbled across my father by accident through the military in 1979, having not seen him for six odd years. Um, and they'd been divorced my whole life. They got divorced shortly after I was born. Uh, and just rekindling those relationships with my father and my, my stepmother and my two half brother, uh, two half sisters and one half brother. Um, so there's, there's sort of family stories in there as well and, and um, a reuniting of families, which is, you know, nice and warm and fuzzy. I mean, that's really good stuff. And you save that for the end. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. So it's for anyone from a, from a family with divorce. Uh, yeah. and separation anyone yeah. with uh, wanting to have a look into life growing up in in Rhodesia you yeah. know, with info on, on the war and uh, that's fantastic yeah like, really, just you know um, the, the show will be out next this show will be out from when we're speaking next week uh, Sunday and um, I just wanted to thank you really for for coming on and I'm looking forward to definitely having you back and thank you for not sharing any of the stuff. I, I promise I won't say anything about the, the freezer incident. And, uh, <laughs> which one? There was one clothed and one naked. <laughs> no, I, I was only aware of the clothed one. So okay. <laughs> maybe okay. we'll discuss over a cup of coffee, the naked oh, one one oh. day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Getting myself into trouble. Yeah, there was a no, really, well, I also must thank you very one. much, Nick. I mean, this is, uh, yeah. I'm sorry if I sound a bit sort of uh, tongue twisted or, or. No, you did better than me. <laughs> but uh, yes, this is something that's completely new to me. Uh, talking in cyberspace is something that I've never been comfortable with, but uh, I'm getting used to it. And, yes. and thank you for the opportunity to, to put something like this together. Um, it's, been, it's been really good. It's uh, my absolute pleasure. I'm very, very grateful to to have been able to to do this and to have you on as well means a lot for me thanks nick great thanks nick